Again. <laughs> <laughs> But I thought for this audience it might be useful if we just had a very short introduction on synthetic uh, biology, just to sort of position yourself. And then the other speakers, I think, will follow up on that, and they'll probably do a better job than me. Um, so this is the formal uh, definition of synthetic biology. This came out of a report. I think it's generally accepted internationally. So synthetic biology aims to design and engineer biological systems, um, parts, and devices as well as re-engineering existing natural biological systems. In simple terms, I think synthetic biology wants to try and make the engineering of biology much more easier, more predictable, more robust. I think that's the general take-home message. So in order to sort of position yourselves in this, I'm going to try and give you a quick analogy just to sort of so you can get your heads around what we're talking about. So if we think of cells and living organisms as you can think of them as sort of as machines, and if you uh, then extrapolate and say, well, okay, the machine that you probably use the most in your life is a computer or a phone, and that that computer has an operating system, which uh, OS, whatever it is, Mountain Lion is the latest OS version, and that that operating system runs your computer, and then you run all these applications on top of it. Well, in some senses, you could consider living systems and cells to be like that, except their operating systems are DNA, this very famous molecule shown here. So in a sense, I want you to think about that analogy that you could imagine a cell having an operating system, which is its genome, which has all the instructions for it to work. So if we extrapolate that, then, so how do we know the operating systems for living organisms? Well, we do because we've got this genome sequencing revolution, if you like, going on since about 2000 or before, actually. And we have many, many uh, genome sequences. So we know the sequences, the operating system, if you like, for many, many different organisms doesn't mean we know how they all work, I should say. So let's think about synthetic biology. So we can now order DNA online on a web. And all of those um, companies here uh, will supply you with various regulations and filters, pieces of DNA. So in some senses, what synthetic biologists are trying to do at the moment, pretty much, is they're trying to design kind of applications for cells, like apps for your, for your, for your iPhone. They're trying to design and rewire genetic circuits that would work in a living cell as you would uh, download from iTunes your latest app or whatever. That's kind of the analogy what I'm trying to um, take you through. So DNA is a programming language and because we can synthesize it and because we begin to know what the sequence of DNA is that allows the operating instructions for cells, this introduces the whole concept of design and I think that's what's so exciting about synthetic biology. So you could imagine cells as programmable manufacturing units. You could program them to make things. You could put in some food, some energy, some water, some oxygen, whatever, have these little cells growing up producing stuff. And I think that's where this crossover comes into this session, actually, which is very interesting. And then uh, just a little bit more detail. So what is a, a, we talk about parts or bioparts, and essentially they're pieces of DNA stitched together. And you can put DNA into cells, you can put them in a plasma, which is a circular piece of DNA, or you can integrate them directly into the genome of that cell. So that's interesting. And this little silly little movie shows a bit of DNA going into a cell. Um, and the idea here is that we're building parts so that have encoded functions. We're then trying to build devices that would have these genetic circuits that would have human defined functions to make a cell sense something to make a cell communicate to each other, whatever. And then we want to build systems, and that might be manufacture something. So these are, this is a sort of engineering um, sort of um, paradigm, an engineering framework for biological um, manipulation. So on to the session. So biomaterials. So I just selected a whole bunch of images, and I'm sure we're going to see more images. And I think what's really interesting about biomaterials is it works at many different scales. And the scales I've been talking about just previously was this very, very micro molecular scale, DNA molecules, cells, whatever. But of course, when we see biomaterials, we're interacting with them. Often they're sort of structures that you can feel and touch as shown on this slide. And there are whole examples, tree bark, coral, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, as you go down biological scale into the real sort of micro nano bio scale, you have this extraordinary uh, structures as well, like actin filaments or bone structures here. <clears throat> and I think that's that, that and there's, a, there's a, a coat of a virus, a tobacco mosaic virus. So that's the sort of molecular structure. So you have these wonderful structures and, and materials, and I think what's really quite interesting, oh, and here, this is actually DNA itself being patterned out onto, onto a, 
on, onto a grid so you can visualize it by, um, by a micros microscopic technique. So you have different scales. So I'm just going to end with uh, this idea of biological scale. I think it's important conceptually to, to understand this. Biology works at massive scale from trees, from humans, whatever, uh, down to centimeters. But biology also then extends all the way down to this area here, which is the 0.0000001 millimeter scale, which is very, 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 very small. Uh, and I think uh, even at this scale down here, you're seeing amazing structures. So I think what's exciting is that with synthetic biology, with engineering, with uh, the, the fusion of those two fields, is there the opportunity perhaps to start thinking about um, materials uh, that we cannot see uh, directly uh, as an opportunity for, for design? Okay, so that's uh, probably it on my introduction. So, oh, that's the book, sorry. That's a shameless, uh, I will immediately turn that off. Um, right, it's my great pleasure to introduce three really fantastic uh, speakers. The first speaker is Suzanne Lee, who uh, Suzanne and I had a, a very uh, interesting discussion and dialogue uh, about her work, uh, which I got very interested in. So Suzanne is director of BioCouture. It's a pioneering research project that um, proposes a sustainable biological manufacturing future, which fits in completely with what I was talking about. Uh, consumer products grown from microbes. I mean, what a fantastically interesting idea. She is a 2012 TED Senior Fellow. She has a book which is for sale outside, I believe, and that's called Fashioning the Future, Tomorrow's Wardrobe. And this uh, is a very exciting interdisciplinary book mapping about fashion, science, technologies, and all that sort of really interesting stuff, which was kind of what we're here today. So Suzanne, without making any more blushes on you, please come and uh, present your <coughs> presentation. So my, my production process suddenly came from thinking not as a designer working with a finished material that someone else has, but actually growing the material. So these are growth baths. This is the sugary green tea with a live starter culture, some acetic um, or some kind of inoculant, usually from a previous batch. It sits on a heat mat. It's regulated at, 30, at 25 degrees C. And after two weeks, it's a static culture, so you don't actually have to do anything to it. It produces that mat that you see on the right there. And if I'm in a production mode to create a garment, this is the most simple way of producing a sheet. Um, so this is my mini fabric farm, and in the summer, I don't need any other energy than the heat of the sun, if we're lucky enough. So this summer wouldn't have been ideal for growing, but it just takes a bit longer. It will still produce material. So this is the kind of prototype fabric farm. Um, the reason I'm doing flat sheets is because it's absolutely the most low-tech, simple process. Um, the ultimate vision for this is something that would grow into a three-dimensional shape. But when you get into body scale, then you need a very big bioreactor that has um, kind of oxygen circulating, and it's a much more complicated thing. So right now, it's very easy to grow it as a sheet. So when the sheets are ready, um, two, millimeters of, uh, two centimeters of wet material is going to give you less than a millimeter of dry material. So it, you need to kind of understand that the cellulose is super hydrophilic. It loves water. It will absorb and hold a huge amount of water. So you kind of learn how much the water evaporates and what, how much material that leaves you with. Um, as a textile, I'm really interested in the flexibility. Um, and that comes from using the, this kombucha mix. And it's the yeast and the bacteria together that give you something which is much more flexible. So I don't want to wash that out too much. So this is just washed out with a detergent and cold water. And then really simply air dried on wooden sheets. Um, if, you, if you dry it like an animal skin, you will actually get a, a, an even better result. Um, and you get an even better result if you have a freeze dryer. But unfortunately, that's an expensive bit of kit that most of us don't have access to. And certainly not for this sort of scale of material. So that's just left to dry. And then the early experiments were just playing around, I guess, like you would with any, with any new material. So just molding it over a 3D shapes, trying it on glass, plastic, wood, metal, seeing, seeing how it kind of um, reacts. And then this was over a body form. Um, and just seeing how much the fabric kind of stretches down and takes on 3D shape. 
And what was interesting about this one was that I was trying to create this kind of perfect thing, and when I came back to it and it had dried, where I'd nailed down the wet material, if you can see the sort of black patches that appeared, and I'd used metal pins in the material, and the material was still very acidic at this point, so it had oxidized. And I was like, oh, no, it's, it's been ruined. But actually, I realized on reflection that what we'd done was just turn something black without using dye. And that actually, if we let the wet material come into contact with the metal, then actually we could produce a black material um, in a much more environmentally friendly way. So it, it was a whole new kind of relationship of thinking about just simple reactions and how they might add to the creative process. So that went on to um, some work that one of our students was doing. and She was really looking at, at how you might collaborate with nature in some way to create effects. So she was producing lots of wooden sheets um, outside and letting the metal wash and create pattern with the rain. And so this is um, actually Heather Smith. And so Heather's work, we started making these kind of patterns on wood. And the wooden drying boards that you saw um, became something that we then started to think about as patterning for, for the work, and also playing with uh, metal wire. So these are close-ups of that, using exactly that process. And when you, when you put the material over something, it also sort of acts like an emboss, so it would al also take on any kind of surface texture there is there. And this was the sort of finished garment, the first finished garment. So this, is, this was kind of a play on, on a black leather biker jacket. So this is a vegetable leather um, biker jacket, which is completely kind of vegan apart from the zips. Unfortunately, no one's got a biodegradable zip yet. But instead of having the black metal studs on a leather like you would normally, we put the metal studs on the wood, the wet material on the wood, and just let the oxidation create the final pattern. Thank you, Suzanne, for a really lovely, amazing talk. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Ellen Jorgensen. Ellen is a molecular biologist, and she's a strong advocate of citizen science. She, she co-founded GenSpace NYC, uh, the world's first community biotechnology laboratory. She had a 30-year career in research and development within commercial biotechnology <coughs> industries. And her work uh, developing GenSpace as a site of innovation and entrepreneurship uh, and citizen science has attracted a lot of international attention, been featured in both scientific magazines like Science and also BBC and PBS. Um, and um, I, I welcome her to come and give her a presentation. Ellen. The citizen aspect of synthetic biology is a very interesting and new concept. So I'll ask, does the mic work? Yeah, I can hear it. Okay, so uh, first I'm gonna show just a very short film, and if I'm lucky, it will play when I fast forward this. How, do, how does this work? Want to be a molecular biologist? Well, you can be at the world's first community laboratory. It works a lot like a gym. Uh, the idea is that you come whenever you'd like and you just you pay dues like you would in a gym. Using mostly donated equipment and found materials, a small group of biology enthusiasts recently created this lab at a warehouse in Brooklyn, New York. We built the lab right on this big open space. It's, it's a big glass cube. All the materials that we've made it out of are found materials. So glass doors, uh, windows that were salvaged and repurposed. 22.4. But why would people want to run lab experiments in their spare time? It is attractive to people who have ideas that aren't necessarily useful, but they're certainly fun. One of the first projects being developed by the Gen Space team is a device that will be launched by helium balloons 30 kilometers into the Earth's stratosphere in search of remote signs of life. The High Altitude Microbial Sampling Station, or HAMS for short, uh, is a weather balloon that's going to be lofted up to about 100,000 feet into the stratosphere capture microbes, hopefully, bring them down uh, in a sterile uh, package, in a, in a sealed package, and then have them analyzed. So far, the garage biotechnologists have just built a prototype of their microbe catcher, but they hope to launch the real deal later this year. 
GenSpace is much more than just a laboratory for do-it-yourselfers. It also provides hands-on educational courses for people to come and learn. It's not just scientists who are working in the lab. It's people who are bringing their own curiosity about the world um, and bringing it to our lab and exploring. The GenSpace founders see themselves on the vanguard of a new movement of DIY biology. So GenSpace is the first community bio lab, but it certainly won't be the last. I, I get the sense that there'll be a lot more labs popping up all over the country and all over the world. And they think labs like GenSpace could revolutionize the study of biology. Now that we've reached a certain level of, of knowledge in the information age, we've come to, the, you know, it's open space for another age, and I think that age will be the biological age. And I think, you know, the next great PC computer or Apple computer won't be a computer at all. It'll be this amazing uh, bacteria that has this amazing application that everyone's going to want to have. I don't know what it is yet. If I knew, I'd be, I wouldn't be talking to you here. <laughs> For Nature Medicine, I'm Ailey Dolgan. So that, that video was made. Um, the guy came and filmed the first class that I ever taught there, so I refused to speak to him. I was so nervous about teaching the class. But th the interesting thing is Dan doesn't mention at all any sort of intersection between design or art and this. And that's because it completely took us by surprise. When we opened our doors, we expected mainly people to walk in who were either science students or what we like to call the Discover Channel crowd, who are really fascinated by science but haven't really done anything with it. And to our great surprise, uh, about half the people who walked through the doors were from design, uh, architecture, art, fields that we had no idea were so interested in what we were doing. And uh, it continues to this day. So uh, I think this is completely appropriate, this session, and, and so timely. So I love, I love this slide, because actually when it was first published, I think it was on the cover of Science, uh, a, a lot of the, the, the more religious people made a big deal out of it. But it's, it's, if you view the DNA along the top of the double helix, you get this marvelous pattern that looks like a rose window. And I think we all know that in the history of design that uh, biological structures have inspired design for, forever. Um, but <laughs> actually using biology to produce things uh, has gotten kind of a bad rap, particularly, I believe, in Europe and in the UK. Um, synthetic biology is, uh, some people think it's a rebranding of genetic engineering, cleverly. But it also is, as uh, Paul was describing, um, a result of the new technology that's coming out that's making it much uh, faster and much more like an industrial process. If you think of the classic, um, Mitch has talked about the classic chair analogy to me since I didn't take art classes, where you start with something that's handmade and then you end up with something that has standardized parts, then that's kind of what synthetic biology does for genetic engineering. And it does it on a, on a high throughput scale. So it does always combine elements of design. and. It, uh, it relies on these processes that now are, are coming online. Uh, if you imagine a car, okay, and where a car was 10 years ago and where it is now, if you look at the technology to read and write DNA code, 10 years ago we did the human genome sequence. If that was a car, it would now cost 10 cents and go 100,000 miles an hour. The, tech, the technology is changing that quickly. So, the BioBricks library is one example of um, uh, an attempt to catalyze these biological parts. And there are teams that compete uh, in undergraduate competitions to use these parts and make things. Actually, this is the team that produced uh, all those pretty colors that Suzanne just showed, uh, the Cambridge team. Uh, they are actually reading uh, Kipling, I believe. They're a British team. They have to read Kipling in the corner by the light of this bacteria. And, but you can see they're imagining the uses for it. They're imagining it lighting up buildings or signs. Um, there are programmable uh, materials. You can program cells to make things in response to something. Can you, so you can imagine a material responding because it's alive. 
Um, and on the nanoscale, you kind of scoop me on a couple of the slides that I have where you can make little tiny wires, you can grow them. Um, you can make uh, proteins in transgenic animals that produce materials. And uh, whoops, that was uh, uh, the DNA slide that you showed, except this is a whole bunch of different patterns that people have made. So here you're using DNA not as a coding uh, device, not something to carry information, but as an actual physical uh, construction material. So if you make the DNA code in a certain way, the electrical charges on it will cause it to self-assemble into these patterns. And because the structure of DNA and, and the patterns that it forms are so mathematically predictable, you can program a computer and say, I want to make this shape, and it will spit out the line of A, T, C, and G that you need, and you can send it off to be synthesized. And when you have the bacteria grow it, it will self-assemble into these patterns. So it's, it's a, just a really wild new world out there for all this stuff. Now, I think most of us are comfortable with this traditional image of the science scientist in the laboratory. But uh, what about this guy? <laughs> um, this is what's happening out there right now. Uh, there are what are called biohacker spaces. They're springing up as a result of several factors. First of all, a lot of people that go through some of these competitions in um, college get hooked and they think it's a lot of fun and they want to continue it on a hobby basis. And because they're working with organisms that are very safe, that the scientific community has decided are safe and have been proven safe over the past 30 or 40 years of genetic engineering, um, they feel that they should be able to create spaces where they can work with these materials and do the same sorts of interesting and creative and useful things that they did when they were in school. Uh, the second thing is that the price of everything is coming down dramatically. You can buy used equipment on eBay. You can order DNA, as Paul was saying, from companies. And the price per base pair is coming down and down and down. I have a slide that I made fairly recently where I think it was 26 cents a base. And I was talking to a guy on the phone from a company that can go down as low as 2 cents a base in some, in some cases. So the, the price barrier is dropping dramatically. So this is a map that's self-identified people. There's a Google group where they all meet and talk called DIY Bio. And this is, these are self-identified biohacking groups. And there are others in the Far East. For some reason, I didn't, I cut off that part of the map. There's actually a hackerspace in London. They're gearing up for it. There are different rules and regulations in different countries in the world. America is kind of the Wild West, as is, I think, a lot of the, the Asian countries. And we have no specific regulations against genetic engineering except the Homeland Security Act that says it has to be for useful and peaceful purposes, which can be interpreted in a number of ways. Um, uh, but I know that here in the UK, you need a license to do genetic engineering, which has been defined as putting a gene from organism A into organism B. So there have been people, actually, there's a, a biohacker in Ireland who managed to get uh, he, he does have training, university training, and he managed to get a license from the Irish government to do genetic engineering in a spare bedroom in his house. So I think that people are going to be pushing the regulations here to do these sorts of experiments and uh, that we may see a change here at some point. But for right now, um, you're safe. Nobody's, nobody's doing this in your backyard yet. Um, I was lucky enough to be a co-founder of a space in Brooklyn, New York. Um, because I had training, uh, I was valuable to the rest of the people, so uh, they let me be president. And we've done pretty well. We do a lot of outreach programs. Um, we have uh, things that we do in collaboration with other nonprofits that have to do with educational stuff. So it's been quite fun. And one of the things that we encourage is for people to bring in any kind of wild idea. As long as they're working with safe organisms, uh, we're cool with it. And that's kind of a unique space where someone can come in and, and do uh, something on the interface of art and design and not have to worry about justifying it to anyone in terms of whether it's useful or it's going to make money. People are very excited about a space like this. 
Um, that's what the space looks like right now. You saw some of it in the movie. It's kind of a mess in this picture. But we're always rearranging it, and we're always doing new things. We have uh, the, the, the glassed-in lab where the, the, everything was recycled. We didn't pay a dime for any of the, the, the fixtures. Everything was um, the old restaurant counters and sliding glass doors were donated. Um, the lab equipment was donated. We have a number of different projects going on. Uh, and surprisingly to me, uh, I wouldn't have guessed, half of them are actually on the interface of art and, and biology. So there's someone who's doing something very interesting. She's finding hair in public <coughs> places. This sounds a little gross. But you can actually extract DNA, DNA from a single hair. Um, and you can do an amplification process, and you can do some um, analysis. And there are genes now that they're associating with physical characteristics, like eye color and hair color. So she can actually then make a portrait of the person that the hair belonged to. Uh, also, you can get mitochondrial DNA that has to do with ancestry. So for example, she'll know right away if the person was um, Asian or African ancestry. So, so she's doing these DNA portraits. Then we have someone who's working with P. vortex, which is the bacteria that makes um, beautiful fractal patterns depending on the environment it's in, the patterns change. Uh, we have um, a guy who is doing a project where he tied the cell cycle to expressing different color in mouse cells. And he coupled that to some output. Uh, I don't remember what it was, but uh, he was kind of a technology art program student, and he was doing a thesis. And one of the most interesting projects that's going on right now was inspired by Suzanne and her work, which is we want to take her bacterial cellulose one step further. And if I can get this to work. So the goal is to engineer new properties into the bacterial cellulose and increase her palette of, ma of materials to work with and increase the value of these materials to other disciplines. So uh, we decided to start with cellulose and chitin. Chitin is the stuff that insect skins are made out of. So you can see it's, it's a very hard polymer. It's very different from cotton. And if you feed the enzyme that makes cellulose, cellulose is just a long chain of sugar molecules. So if you imagine a string of beads, and they're all the same color bead. And now what you want to do is throw in a different color bead and that's what chitin, chitin is just a, diff, a, a long chain of a different color bead. It's N-acetylglucosamine. And if you feed the enzyme that makes the cellulose polymer out of the monomers, chit, the chitin subunit, it'll actually incorporate it. So now you have a string that has basically different colored beads in it in sort of a random manner. And we're very excited to see how this is going to change the physical properties. Is it going to make it harder? Is it going to make it stiffer? Is it going to make it more waterproof, which would be kind of the holy grail for Suzanne? And um, we can also do other cool things, which is to not actually incorporate them into the cellulose, but into the bacteria so that wonderful cellulose will absorb it. We can put in a scent. There are things that make bacteria smell like wintergreen or bananas. Uh, there are colors that uh, not only the fluorescent colors that are proteins, but you can engineer pathways that uh, synthesize colored dyes right in the bacteria at the same time. So the dye factory is in the bacteria and not in a vat. So that's kind of where we're heading with this. And all this can be done in a community bio lab. And we love it when people come in with wild projects. And we as scientists sit down and discuss how we can make that a reality. And if they can't do it with one material, maybe they can do it with another. So this is the cloning scheme, in case anyone's interested. Maybe Paul's interested. <laughs> is we, we basically take the three genes that are needed in this pathway, and we, we actually had, we sent out to a company, had them synthesize them in pieces, stitch them together. And this is another fascinating thing. DNA is linear. It's like a tape. And you cut pieces of it, and you literally have enzymes that stitch them back together. So when I was listening to that dialogue between the, uh, the, the, clothing, uh, the clothing maker and the surgeon, I thought, well, actually, 
people who do genetic engineering can kind of understand this too, because you're cutting and pasting different things together to make a whole garment in a way, a whole series of genes or a whole organism. And it's very physical, except it's so small you can't see it. Whoops. So actually you can see it, but only as sort of nasty little globs of bacteria sitting on a plate. So that's about where we are right now. So we're not anywhere near the clothing step yet, but we'll get there. And I just wanted to say that uh, having this, this interaction with a community that's so different from mine has really enriched me as a scientist, I think. It's, it's helped me think in other directions, and it's been just a lot of fun. So I'll turn it over to Mitch now. Okay, so the final speaker is Dr. Mitch Joachim, if I got it right, I hope, is Associate Professor at New York uh, University and co-president of the Terraform One, a nonprofit architecture and urban design think tank that advocates uh, sustainable community-focused urban development. Uh, Mitch has got a PhD from MIT uh, um, and has also won awards for his work, including the Victor Papanek Social Design Award and the History Channel Infinity Award for City of the Future. Uh, Mitch is a senior TED Fellow, um, and his work's been featured in many uh, interesting media outlets, including The Wired Magazine, Time, Rolling Stones, all the sort of things that I will never, ever get to publish in. Um, <laughs> And has listed, uh, the Ro actually the Rolling Stone, I'm really jealous about this one, has listed him as one of the hundred people who are changing America. Good luck, Mitch. <laughs> hey, super great to be here. The arrow is obviously in the wrong place. Uh, but uh, I'm somewhere in between uh, Ellen and Suzanne, both a uh, designer and a scientist uh, in one, except for these guys have better hair. I think they're more sophisticated, better looking, smarter. Etc. But I do work with uh, do work with them, uh, especially Ellen. Every day we share a similar space. So I'm going to show some of the work that we do at Terraform One, a nonprofit architecture and design science laboratory uh, that accepts everyone from poets to engineers and anything in between. One of the first or earlier projects is called the Fab Tree Hab. It's taking a technology that's 2,500 years old called pleaching or grafting inosculate matter into one contiguous system. This is uh, essentially trees, but you can do it with any woody matter or uh, woody plant matter, such as epiphytes. Uh, we've been controlling the geometry to produce homes, homes that have a metabolic fitness with their ecosystem. So we kind of nudge nature into volume and create uh, structure and space. Uh, it is a part of the landscape. It accepts the idea that critters are supposed to be on the outside of the house and they're welcoming. It does take a different kind of uh, filter of reason when you look at these homes. You need a kind of uh, un understanding of carpentry slash botany, but this is uh, something that can grow five to seven years, and you'd have a home or an entire village for thousands of families that has a positive contribution to the ecosystem. Not a neutral contribution, like a carbon zero building, which is interesting, but we don't really want to be neutral like Switzerland. We want to do something that's active and be accountable for <laughs> 100 years plus of pollution. So uh, this is the model for the MoMA. This is uh, it growing. Uh, it's been great to be an architect that made a treehouse uh, that, that's been fairly popular. I uh, get lots of people, mostly kids, writing me letters, speaking in English for the first time, saying they want to stop pollution and grow up in, uh, you know, or they want their parents to live there too and grow up in, and, and uh, be an architect just like me. And I'm kind of cool with the first two parts, more or less, but when they want to be an architect, to try and nudge them to an investment banking or something else, <laughs> satisfying life. Uh, so Ellen, uh, it's been great to work with her. Uh, we have been doing the Treehouse Project for some time. My roommate at Harvard, Dr. Oliver Medvedic, uh, teamed up with Ellen when we built our biolab space uh, there some time ago, like 2007. And together, Oliver and Ellen and all these uh, scientists came together and formed GenSpace, uh, which Ellen is kind of president. This is the latest view. I decided to take a dark photo of it so it looks a little bit better. Uh, there, but, but uh, we work side by side uh, as much as possible, at least our, our teams do. So you have an architect's office inside of a, a kind of a, a biology lab, uh, and it's quite an interesting floor. There's people that do robotics and nanotech, etc. So uh, one of the earlier projects is a kind of a propaganda piece to push synthetic bio to the kind of foregrounds of our imaginations and, and, and to comprehend its possibilities. We took a, a part of a paper 
from a student uh, that Oliver was working with at Harvard, which is about printing extracellular matrix from pigs into specific geometries. We start building out those geometries. One of the things that you can make is something like this, a bladder. Uh, I know the New York Times just did an article two days ago. Please don't send me the link. I've got everyone on the planet sending me the link. We've, very, I know all about it, but you can grow an esophagi, a cartilage of your knee. Uh, 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 this is a bladder to replace a, 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 a person's bladder who had prostate cancer. Uh, but the thing is, is with PGA scaffolding, you can control any ge geometry and craft, as you will, using synthetic biology. So we started thinking, well, well, what can we do with this material? Well, first we can start thinking about leather shoes that where no sentient creature is harmed, completely victimless, uh, belts, handbags, any kind of industrial designed object. Uh, of course, house came to mind because we're architects, so we proposed this kind of meat house as a kind of a rejection of the veggie house that we'd done before. This is the, my favorite section. This is a typical stud wall construction you'd find any place in America. And this is our idea for what the meat house could be crafted into. Uh, it's got fatty cells for insulation, cilia for wind loads, and then sphincter muscles for doors and windows. It's a whole new meaning to letting the air out. We, you know, this is one of the designs. Uh, if you know Louis Kahn, this famous American architect who talked about what does the brick want to be? And he'd give you this dissertation on the meaning of bricks and geometry and, and you know, brilliant guy. Uh, we were confronting meat or cells and we didn't know what the meat wanted to be. So we thought this would be one idea, although it could be an English tutor if you would like. Uh, this is the, the, the version that we demoed in the lab. It's very expensive to do this, but we were pushing uh, the boundaries to try and create a meat house. We didn't want to keep it alive. Uh, that is, it has no kind of immunological system. It's got no ability to continue to grow. Uh, it's essentially, we design it to die or curate it like uh, beef jerky with lots of sulfates and nitrates. Uh, and it's just great shelf life, Twinkies. Uh, and, and there it is. And then we had a big show in Prague and we put the meat house in front of the cathedral so religion can confront it. There they go. And then other projects are about, we, we were in love with waste and Wally, so we were looking at, uh, and we get to think about waste and how it relates to biology in a second, but uh, uh, these types of materials and controlling their geometry instead of dumb bales of, you know, trash, whether it's plastic bottles or, or uh, you know, paper, we decided that, uh, you know, we can make intelligent puzzle-fitting geometries out of this material. And actually the biology side is making these Petri dishes that would eat that material and, and replace it with, uh, in this case, mycelium. So these are some of the petri dishes that would eat that waste. We had a big show at the New Museum of Contemporary Art where we did an exact architectural model and projected uh, uh, our kind of version of this waste being eaten by mycelium, or essentially it's the, the root structure of reishi or mushroom. So we turned the museum into a big mushroom. It only takes seven days, you can grow it to any size. Ecovative is a company that does this already. They produce packaging materials out of mushrooms. Uh, we're doing the exact same thing. Uh, we are licensed with them. Uh, they're really fun guys. They're manufacturers. We are designers, scientists, and artists. This is a project we've done to explain to the average American the amount of waste we produce. So Homer Simpson, who's not probably at this conference or would never come to this conference, give him some understanding of the amount of trash that we produce. So we're using this waste, growing it biologically into these intelligent, intelligently fitting bricks, and that was a one-hour tower showing you the amount of waste we produce in New York City in one hour. This is 24 hours of waste in the city of New York. It produces a 53-story skyscraper per day in the city of New York made out of compacted articulated trash. That's just showing you a detail of how we'd wrap around uh, recycled aluminum with a high embodied energy around the mycelium to give it more uh, shearing strength. Mycoform uh, is the kind of showing you the, the mushroom itself taking on any shape, this one kind of a cubert like shape. And then explaining this to, we, we, we go out to public spaces. This one was in Darmstadt in Germany, which means I think intestine or something like that. And showing them the amount of waste that they use every day. Uh, this is, uh, it, we had a, about 30 students at TU Darmstadt, Germans, very you know, precise. We filled up a room uh, the size of this, except it was a gymnasium with the amount of e-waste they have every day, uh, and then built these uh, cute robots with QR tags and deployed them throughout the city. This was a 38-foot one that we had made, showing them all around. And then, uh, and, and this was, we actually, this, we, we couldn't doctor this photo whatsoever, but this is one of the public spaces we put these waste robots in. Uh, the, you know, the German uh, sanitary, whatever, sanitation crew came and, 
and you know, they were sight circling around it, deciding whether it was art or trash, or art <laughs> or trash. And about five minutes, it, they decided it was trash, and then we said, no. We uh, you know, explained to them we're doing this big project, and you know, they should come to the opening, and, so, and they did, but they, they came dressed just like that, <laughs> very dedicated. So the last thing I will show is a kind of a collaboration between Suzanne Lee as a kind of an expert consultant working with the Cetobacter. Uh, and many other materials, and certainly GenSpace itself with Ellen and her incredible team. Uh, we you know, combined to work on the International Genetic Engineering Machines Conference, uh, which are going to enter November, uh, sorry, October, so we we're almost there, which you know, we shouldn't be here, but we, we we're very excited to be here, uh, kind of explain it, but we were working at a combination of the mushrooms uh, combined with the acetobacter, forming a biocomposite. So, Kind of like the architect in me just thought plywood, layer all this stuff together and something will, will happen. Uh, and here, here is certainly the lab between uh, GenSpace and Terraform. These are some of the images showing you our early experiments because we didn't know what the chair was going to be. We had no idea what a biologically grown chair was going to be like. It certainly wasn't going to look like this, uh, which would made me very upset. I, you know, I thought, so 20th century, what can we really do? Uh, so we've been experimenting with the, the, the mushroom systems, working with the acetobacter from kabucha. So we had that bacteria growing, and then we'd fuse them together while they were wet. And it was wonderful to see the, the kind of the different structures that were formed. We wanted to express chitin to make it fully waterproof, but we wanted a chair that would be absolutely produced from synthetic biology. That would be absolutely green, part of the metabolism of the planet, something that you can use for three years, like an Ikea chair, and then when it breaks or you have to throw it out, uh, it, it composts or returns something positive to the environment. Oh, this is showing you the different stages. We produce molds, uh, uh, thermal forming in this case, although we've used every different type of version. We had pneumatic system blowing up pillows out of acetobacter, et cetera, and combining those molds then folding over the sheets of uh, kabucha or the acetobacter and then getting this kind of combined shape. Uh, here is showing the mycelial propagation, just seven days, pretty much this whole thing grows. That is the idea. Uh, and go, starting from the waste material, uh, some, which is this, uh, the cellulosic material in here, and then being a, taken over by the mushroom until eventually it's all, that, all gone and replaced with this kind of very stiff substance. Uh, here, this kind of the cellulose and the chitin uh, uh, together, one kind of material, thumbtacks for scale, to kind of let you know what we're working with. Then building out the computational geometry. What would this chair be like? Uh, we thought, I don't know, it's a coccyx for your coccyx, a kind of a little tailbone that your tailbone sits on, kind of wiggles. It would, you can add them together and make kivas or arrangements of these kinds of chairs. And this is the, uh, the, the kind of the final one that we are going to get. Uh, this is essentially uh, that, that cellulosic biocomposite structure formed in a chair that has a whole new meaning of craft for us. It is not this kind of vernacular system that we understand, you know, handcrafted, one-off uh, made chair, which is a very different way of thinking. It is certainly not, you know, the, the kind of mid-century uh, Charles and Raheem's version of a chair where you make a spectacle of the manufacturability of the object. It's all using high embodied uh, materials like steel and wood, et cetera. It's a completely different kind of uh, chair itself. It is, it is driven by biology. Its purpose is for the earth. Uh, it, is, uh, a much, it, is, it is food for some other life form. Uh, it's, we, don't, we, don't, we don't know what all the full potentials are, so it could be more than just a seat, certainly a material that can make walls, lecterns, uh, stages. It's just simply a, a wonderful, adaptable biocomposite. So we're just beginning now to, uh, to work it out. So that's, that's all I have time, but that's kind of, that explains everything that we've been up to, and we really want to you know, uh, answer some questions. So thank you, thank you very much.